Chapter 37 The Shadow of the Ministries Come here, Stable Dweller. There are things you should know. Finally, at long last, I have reached this point in the story. At this point, I beg your permission to take a little liberty with the telling of it. It had been a long and winding road getting to Canterlot, and I still have to tell of the difficulties and discoveries that faced us there. The most vital of these discoveries was the six memory orbs, the one, the final memory orbs, which I had found there. In those memories, the veils began to part, showing me my true place in the world, my purpose in life, and how everything was going to end. I finally got my first glimpse of my own destiny. That it took so long is possibly exasperating, and you might wonder why I didn't skip to this part sooner. In truth, I have skipped over a fair bit, trying to tell you only the parts of my adventures that were important or exciting enough to keep you reading. I have told you these things, I suppose, for the same reason that Princess Luna told her story to Midnight Shower. Context. Only with the proper context can you see how meaningful these memories were, and how they set my hooves on the right path. That ended with me coming here and doing what I'm about to do. For all that, there was a long and brutal journey still ahead of me, and I had only seen glimpses. I had not found my virtue. I did not understand my role in this world, and I was utterly unaware of the war about to descend upon us all. I did not view them until our time in Canterlot was over, and I feel it would be too much to tell them all at once. Too much for me, at least, to try and relive them all in order like that. So, with your indulgence, I will diverge with proper chronology, chronology and scatter my telling of these memories throughout the much longer story of our experiences in Canterlot. Thank you for bearing with me on this. Well, that's awful fast, Calamity commented, staring at the pink light mist that was already filling the streets of Canterlot as we looked down from high above. The steady rain had washed the pink cloud out of the air in the days before, and yet the cloud was dense enough to tint the air merely half a day later. Most of the city was built from stone carved from the very mountain Canterlot embraced. Cobblestone streets had their lining with elegant structures formed from stone and mortar, or magically molded rock. Most buildings of stone still stood, although craked and crumbled from the weight of unnatural ages. As we flew by, a three-story tower, once in upscale inn, collapsed with a deep th throated rumble, sending up crumbling swirls of pink-tainted stone dust. Everything more susceptible to the entropy of the cloud had been reduced to rust and rubble, smears and stains that once signified, uh, signified objects, and decrepit structures stained pink and falling apart at the seams. Oddly, some of the most preserved things were those that had once been alive. The black and twisted forms of the dead trees lined streets filled with the dark, pink rotted bones, many of which had partially sunk into the discolored cobblestones. The only other place that looked eerily preserved was the cluster of buildings that had once formed the heart of Equestria. From a scattered white stone towers to the royal castle itself. And the colored mist had settled everywhere, faint in the air below us, thicker on the streets and between the still standing structures. It only gets worse with each passing hour, Steelers warned us. By morning, the pink cloud will have returned to its full strength. I pressed my lips together in determination before saying, won't be a problem. After Zebra Town, I'm not going to spend any longer here than I absolutely have to. One of the things our experiences in Zebra Town had made clear was the threat posed by the Pink Cloud and was directly proportional to its concentration. We had spent hours in the light haze of the cloud that persisted in the Zebra Town police station with only minor health problems. Nothing couldn't be remedied by a health potion and some time in fresh air. 
The places where the pink cloud pooled thickly, however, were lethal, beyond even Steel Hooves' description of it. We're going to land right in front of the Ministry of Image, we dash in, and grab what we came for, I told my companions. Then, we gallop to the Ministry of Awesome, get what we need from it, and go. With any luck, we'll be in and out in under an hour. We had spent these earlier parts of the day helping Glyphmark. Even now, Zenith was still down there, imparting all she could about zebra stealth techniques to the young adult zebras. At least, in such a short amount of time. Now the sun was setting, dipping below the clouds to paint the whole world in hues of fiery orange and bloody red. We hoped to take some advantage of the impending darkness. Are you sure this place wasn't hit? Bavadamdi asked observing the level of damage that was evident throughout the city. Is all that just from age? The intro pick effects of the pink cloud speeds decay, Steelers noted. If the city were not made largely of stone, it would have crumbled to dust long ago. Only the magically protected places are significantly intact. I reckon a fair bit of damage was done by the explosion when the shield came down too. Calamity commented as he circled at a safe height, drawing us over the outlying city and towards the castle itself. I thought the missiles had stopped striking after the pink cloud went off. Yep, and that's how I read it too, but that ain't the explosion I'm thinking of, Calamity explained. Remember the mega spell pumped through all that cloud to Canterlot to make the air look solid pink? And it weren't like the shield weren't full of air to begin with. Of course, the air pressure in Canterlot would have been, well, I'm not sure how high, but it would have been pretty high. No wonder the pink cloud seeped into everything it touched, to the extreme which it did. I expect the moment the shield went down, there was one hell of a, well, you saw it, Steel Hooves, am I right? I didn't notice. Silo said, with a mostly defiant tone. I was a little too focused on the falling wave of pink water. I reviewed what we had learned of our so-called dry run for Canterlot in Zebratown. Beyond the fact that Steelhoos and I disagree on what dry means. The greatest danger we expected to face in Canterlot was the pink cloud itself, but the interior of Zebratown police station wasn't much different than Canterlot right now and so I was highly confident that we would be fine as long as we minimalized our exposure. Likewise, we knew that the pink cloud had the potential to fuse objects to flesh, or each other. That only seemed to be a concern, while within the highest concentrations, at which point such fusions were the very least of our health concerns. As such, I announced that I was going to wear my pit buck and my armor. I'm going to put on my battle saddle the moment we touch down, Clamity responded. That is a foolish choice, Steelers retorted, pointing out, if you insist on taking the risk of wearing armor, your enclave armor not only offers a much higher degree of protection, but its magical energy weapons are far more suitable for battling some of the dangers we are most likely to face. Our Candlelock Ghoul's words reminded me of the more painful lessons from Zebratown. My combat skills were almost worthless here. The two enemies we were likely to face were Cantalot, Zombies, and Alicorns. None of my weapons were worth a damn against the latter once, we got, once they got their shields up, or against the former at all. In order to stop a Cantalot ghoul, I'd not only have to take them down, but then run up and hack off their heads somehow. Unfortunately, bullets don't tend to decapitate. Yeah, I know all that, Clamid responded stubbornly. But while I know the chances are mighty slim, I still ain't taking the risk that I might be fused into that damn thing. He spat, for emphasis. Our other environmental concern was the broadcasters. Steelers warned that any broadcasting system, from pickbuck broadcasters to sprite bots, were likely to have become twisted into lethal traps, even on the inside. Fortunately, he also assured us that we should be normal be able to hear the damn things before we get into their kill zones. Both of the broadcasters I had fallen victim to before had been underwater, preventing me from hearing them, and both times I had been traveling swiftly enough that I had been 
thrust into their deadly area of effect before I could react. Hopefully, traveling cautiously would allow us to avoid such death traps while in Cantalat itself. Returning to his previous observation, Clamity mused. Still, that's a lot of pink cloud coming back awful fast. You sure it's just seeping back up out of the streets and such? As opposed to what? Steel had queried. As opposed to, I don't know, being fed somehow? Steelus flicked his metal shrouded tail. You think that the mega spell might still be going? I felt a chill. I can't reckon how all the pink cloud ain't been washed away if it ain't. That was a deeply unpleasant thought. Velvet spoke up. But that would be insane. If the spell just kept going, it would eventually poison all of Equestria. The zebras couldn't have wanted that. No. Not even they would have. I recalled the rumor Steelers had mentioned. If the shield fell, the zebras launched mega spells to finally obliterate the city. But if that is true, then those missiles never reached their destination. It's possible, I offered, that they might have designed it to function indefinitely, just to ensure it would last as long as they needed it to. And because they expected it to be destroyed along with Canterlot shortly after the shields fell, after it had done its job and murdered the princesses. Pirate let out a mournful note. We flew in silence for a few moments more. No, I said, telekinetically snatching the Fluttershy orb away from Velvet Remedy as she brought it up out of one of her medical boxes. She gasped as the orb floated away from her. Little Pip, give that back, she demanded, her voice lowering. I frowned, but shook my head. You've been losing yourself in this too much, Velvet. It's really beginning to worry me. I've been letting this go for weeks. After all, her reliance on the Fluttershy Orb had seemed to wane after Pyrolite had joined us. But ever since the Balefire Phoenix had been injured, and Velvet Remedy had neglected a dying pony to save her, my unicorn friend had been turning to the orb with greater frequency than before. Excuse me? Velvet huffed, telekinetically snatching it back. I'm pretty sure I've spent nowhere near the amount of time lost in memory orbs as you have, she pointed out, and I've been a lot smarter about when and where to do so. Ouch. Okay, true, but at least I'm not viewing the same one over and over and over, I said, trying to sound reasonable. That can't be healthy. Velvet frowned. Because I like this one. No matter how bad it is out there. I can always find some solace in Fluttershy. I cringed inside. And yes, it is escapism. So is reading a book, she challenged. Why would you be so concerned if I read the same book over and over? We, have all, we all have our little things that help us get through the day. And at least mine isn't self-destructive. I could feel her on the verge of bringing up party-time mentals, but Velvet Remedy refrained herself, not wishing to cut that deep. Instead, she sighed. This world is horrible, and I don't seem to be doing a whole lot to make it better. All my friends insist on risking death or dismemberment on a daily basis. I don't, Stilus interjected. Yes, well, you're being an entirely different problem, aren't you? Velvet snapped. My old home was assaulted. Those I knew slaughtered. And now, we're about to dive into poison at the behest of a psychotic... Deposit, who would see the instinction of pony kind, so maybe a little escapism is in order just to keep my sanity. Silus turned towards me but said nothing. I knew my own reasons for wanting to curb her Fluttershy worship, but this clearly wasn't the way. What was that? Velvet Remedy asked, changing the subject with a point of her hoof. I watched her tuck the orb away before turning to see what caught her eye. The setting sun was passing behind a tall, slender, white spire that rose up out of the city, taller than the highest tower of the castle, and flanked by a pair of marble wings, easily three stories tall. The light of the sun seemed to ignite the nimbus around the spire, as its shadow slashed across us at the city below. The Celestia Monument, she lives informed us. Princess Luna had a condition, or constructed, after Princess Luna stepped down to honor her 
after a thousand years of peaceful rule. Of course. That would be why it's taller than the castle, Velvet Remedy nodded. Luna was making it clear to everypony that she didn't see herself as a replacement for Celestia. Beyond the Celestian monument stretched a lifeless field lined with ugly dead trees that seemed to stretch out of the dirt like grasping skeletal claws. The field was bordered, bordered by broken cobblestone walkways. In the center sank a huge rectangular pool of pink saturated water. Rising opposite the monument was the royal castle itself, a glorious mass of crumbling spires and cracked white stone. The field was flanked, or flanked by silent sentinels of six preserved buildings, standing across from each other like pieces on a chessboard. The ministries, even now a shadow of their regal and impressive former selves. This was Ministry Walk. And that there's a whole lot of alicorns, Calamity whistled, staring down at the dark forms which swam around at the far end of the Ministry Walk. We had been warned of alicorns in the Canterlot ruins, but I had assumed they would be scattered around the city. Instead, they amassed in Ministry Walk. It was almost as if something about the castle drew the alicorns close like bugs to a lantern. So much for settling down in Ministry Walk. They would be all over us before the Sky Bandit touched the ground. The Alicorns were yet another enemy that my skill with firearms was pretty much useless against, at least as soon as they got their shields up. Alicorns were some of the most dangerous and powerful opponents in the Question Wasteland, but at least they were predictable. The encounter in Zebra Town changed all that. In the pink, the Alicorns lost their tele telepathy and their concentration and their connection with the goddess. Here, they were individuals, and their tactics and demeanor radically changed. Logically, I didn't have enough experience to be sure, but my instincts were telling me to expect these alicorns to be more clever than the ones I had fought in Napalusa and Manhattan. Their individuality would allow for more creative tactical thinking. At the same time, they should be less coordinated. And, if my suspicions bore out, less magically threatening, with the exception of what I had come to think of as their bred powers. All Olicorns seemed to possess the same spells, but the only spell the Olicorns had used in Zero Town, aside from their shields, was a lightning bolt spell, and only one of them had used that. If all of them had possessed the full range of spells normal for Olicorns, we should have been slaughtered. Instead, I'd come to suspect the Alicorns were all tapped into a common pool of spell knowledge, one granted by the goddess, and when they lost their connection to her, they lost most of their spells as well. Too bad the damn shield spell seemed to inherit. Okay, new plan, I announced. We land in that cluster of buildings on the opposite side of the Celestial Monument, and we sneak our way in, moving quickly from building to building until we reach our targets. Steel Hooves, which of those buildings is the Ministry of Awesome? The Ministry of Awesome is the smaller building, made of glassy black stone, furthest up, right next to the castle and across from the Ministry of Morale. Steel Hooves answered, adding for clarification. The Ministry of Morale is the one with the ta uh, morning tower of Pinkie Pie Balloons. Right next to the castle. Of course it was. I brought up my eyes forward sparkle as Calamity winged us back around the monument and started to look for a good place to land. Directly behind the monument stretched out an assemblage of moderately preserved structures adorned with golden rooftops. The buildings were littered over a generous expanse of space that I imagined must have been a park. A small river snaked through it and the water tainted by ribbons of pink, terminated at an inner city lake. Here we go, Weber Pony, Clamity called out as he picked a spot and began to shed altitude. I was thanking, thankful for Clamity's warning, even though we weren't really doing anything to brace ourselves. Velvet Remedy took a deep breath. Apparently, 
intending to hold it while we dropped down through the pink cloud. We dropped into the park. The tint of the sky transformed the sunset into something utterly alien. The red and orange hues shifting into sickly mag magnificent colors. Yay. Well, even the change of plans should be in and out within just a few hours. My eyes forward sparkle flashed a location name set in my pitbuck automapping spell. Princess Celestia's school for gifted unicorns. A cluster of lights flared up on my EFS compass. None of them immediately hostile. I turned my attention in the direction as Calamity flew us down towards the rooftops of the tallest buildings. The lights came from one of them. I urged Calamity to fly a little closer. Ivory Tower, my EFS proclaimed, as we neared the elegant structure topped with a golden onion. Graduate Studies. One of the uppermost floors of the ivory tower had boasted a beautiful, multi-storied window. During the Megaspell attack, mounting air pressure had caused the window to implode, and the whole tower had filled with pink cloud. As we passed, I could see into what had once been a library, the books all long rotted away. The ivory tower had become a pooling place. I could see thick wisps of nearly solid pink floating up the stairs from the chamber below. Several darkened reptilian forms slouched about the library, occasionally flexing leather wings. One of the creatures was curled up in a shattered bowl of what had once been a giant hourglass, snoozing soundly. Dragons. Canter ghoulized adolescent dragons. About Spike's age, I thought, as I remember being trapped in Spike's body, recalling the feel of his wings. They could be siblings, I realized, trapped forever in underdeveloped bodies that could never grow and would not die. The sight struck me with a melancholy chord in my heart, a sad note that continued to play, even as three of their corresponding lights shifted to red. Three of the cantalot dragons rounded, watching as we passed, then spread out their wings and launched themselves after us. Steelers reacted immediately dashing towards the back window of the Sky Bandit. Steel Hooves, wait! I called out, unsure if my actions were wise, but unwilling to make the mistake of shooting first yet again. Velvet, you're up! Letting out the breath she had been holding, Velvet only jumped to her hooves, flashing me an odd expression as she passed. It was either her way of silently saying about time, or she was still upset with me overtaking the Fluttershy Orb. Velvet's horn glowed softly as Steelhoof stepped aside, making way for her. Dragons of Canterlot, her voice boomed, magnified majestically. We are but very, uh, little pony travelers, humbled to be in your magnificent presence. We beseech you to allow us passage through your territory. We promise our visit will be brief, and there will be no bother. Really? Steelhoof rumbled, his tone making it clear but what I mean diplomacy couldn't possibly work. No, she whispered back. Not really. She turned back to me. Sorry about this, little pip. Food! One of the dragons bellowed. Great. They ate ponies. Of course they ate ponies. Mr. Topaz had been planning a feast. Why, yes, of course, Velvet replied. I wouldn't think of passing through your home without bringing something to pay the toll. With that, she floated out one of the dresses she had brought for me at Tempony Tower. The only one, I noted, which had several pretty sapphires woven into the hems. I'm afraid I only have one gift, so I do hope you don't mind sharing. She tossed the garment out of the Sky Bandit's back window, and the three dragons immediately scrambled after the gemstone-studded dress. Turning back around, Velvet Remedy smiled and suggested, Let's get inside before they finish fighting each other. I leapt from the Sky Bandit the moment it touched the ground, levitating our supplies with us. We had left everything but the essentials back with Zenith at Glyphmark. Clemity released himself from the harness. Hey, look, Clemity said, pointing between a nearby building at the rubble of Clip Clop's clipboards. 
a few blocks away. Maybe we should stop by there on our way back, he suggested, as we all began to gallop towards the closest building. Perfect place to get a blade of armor for the Sky Bandit. No, getting sidetracked. Wait, what? I blinked at Clamity Confusion. Yep, ain't you noticed all the clipboards lying about everywhere? Clamity asked, flying alongside of us. Darn things are nigh instructable. I honestly hadn't noticed. But then, I didn't scavenge as relentlessly as Clamity did. Still, clipboards as armor? He had to be joking. Made out of pure, compressed, obstinium. That is, Clamity continued. Bet you not even little Macintosh could punch a hole in one. Obstinatanium. There was no such thing as... Oh, I got it now. Well, sure. The new ones were. But only after they stopped making them out of stubbornite. Careful there, Jules grunted. The Apple family has monopoly on stubbornite mines. Velvet Remedy chased after us. A confused expression on her face. I thought they were apple farmers, she whispered to Pyrelite, who was flying alongside of her. Well, shucks, Clemity said. If some ponies hadn't been hogging all the stubbornite for themselves, maybe they would have run out. Like they did. I'll have you know that Applejack had never once hogged stubbornite, she lives countered. She used every bit she had. I blinked. Mouthing, mouth hanging open. Did Steel Hooves just make a joke about Applejack? Wow. The wave of pain blasted through my head as I reached the steps of the building door. May have has flashed the name of the building amidst the medical warnings. I felt like there was a vice tightening around my horn. My vision blurred and my ears began to ring. I stumbled back and the pain immediately faded. Whoa! I called out holding out a forward leg to stop those behind me. I wasn't fast enough. Clamity didn't stop, flying right over me and slamming through the door. As soon as the door was open, I could hear static. Clamity was halfway into the lobby, beyond, when he landed, staggering and spun around. I could see blood beginning to seep out of his ears and the corners of his eyes as he turned to look towards us, his face grimacing in pain. Then he looked up, above us, and a bit in the air. I could see his bloodied eyes widened as he realized there wasn't he wasn't wearing his battle saddle. Wobbling, he shouted out, pointing above the door. Little Pip, there! He toppled to his knees. I dashed inside, drawing little Macintosh from its holster, ignoring the explosions of pain in my head and a sudden tint of red in my eyes. I spun around, instantly spotting the school's public access speaker built into the wall, just above the burst bust of Goddess Celestia, that looked down on us above the door. Blam! My first shot missed, digging a hole in the wall near the speaker. My vision was getting rapidly worse, and I couldn't use my targeting spell. I didn't recognize the speaker as the target. There was nothing for it to lock onto. Blam! Blam! My second shot shattered the princess's face. The third hit the speaker, which exploded into a shower of sparks. The sound of static softened, but still remained. The pain didn't go away. There was at least one more speaker in here. I looked around, but my vision was swimming in red. I couldn't see anything. The ringing in my ears drowned out nearly everything else. I could barely hear the explosions all around me as I lost my equilibrium and fell to my side, my vision fading to black. My vision cleared again almost instantly, leaving my ears softly ringing and a comparatively minor headache beating in my brain. The others had charged in after me, and from the smoke and debris, Stulus had grenade machine gunned the upper walls of the lobby until the static stopped. I groaned and sat up, wiping blood from my eyes. We have a problem, Velvet Remini informed me. Her voice seemed strange and far away. I blinked at her, trying to clear my vision, then looked towards the entrance where she was pointing. A shield spell had descended over the front of the door, apparently shooting up the lobby in Celestia's private school of magic, triggered defenses.
We made it up to the third floor before finding that the stairwell to the next floor had caved in, forcing us to cut through the classrooms to reach the stairwell on the opposite side. Our plan to avoid the detours was off to a bad start. I pushed the door open, checking my EFS for hostiles, then made my way up to the classroom. The building was old, but mercifully free of the pink cloud, allowing us to proceed cautiously. As we operated under the assumption that the administrator's office on the top floor would have a terminal capable of shutting off the shields locking us inside. At least, that is what we had assumed the large space at the top of the tower was meant to be based on a map which had decorated the lobby's back wall. A map which had lost large chunks under Steel Hoop's grenade barrage. Even in a state of decay, the room was elevated by torches or Touches of class that set it apart from the buildings outside the canterlot. Filigree on the walls and furniture, the tattered remains of rotting banners, the cracked marble tiles of two-tone blue checkerboard floor. I paused, staring at the globe tucked into the corner, the confidence beginning to peel off its surface. Strangely, I'd always considered Equestria to be flat. I looked around. The last lesson taught in this room was apparently astronomy, as the chalkboard still bore a diagram of, if I was reading it correctly, the single path on which the sun and the moon circled our world. This was not something the science class in Sable 2 had covered. We had learned instead about mechanics and robotics, arcane science, and spellcraft. I had sometimes pondered where the sun went when Celestia put it away. Imagining that it was hidden underneath us, possibly taking a nap. If this diagram was true, then Celestia was sending it to another part of the world to make it day someplace else. I wonder if that was the faraway land where the zebras lived, or maybe the place where dragons originated from. Did that mean Nightmare Moon had locked them in eternal day, slowly roasting them alive? And how messed up did things have to be in order for the Pegasi to occasionally see the sun and the moon and the sky at the same time. Unbelievable, Lord Remedy intoned. I turned to see that I was not the only one distracted by the contents of the room. Velvet had trotted up the steps and ran along the ringing rows of chairs on the side of the room opposite the blackboard. At the top, near another doorway, were several posters. Velvet was staring at each one featuring a small filly magically protecting a shield around herself, and her family, as an evil-looking zebra lowered a stick of dynamite towards her with a fishing pole. They were actually teaching children to use their shield spells to protect themselves from a mega spell attack, Velvet Remedy stomped. From the poster, I gleaned that the spell was one of the first taught to any unicorn, who had capacity to learn it. They might as well have been telling them to hide under their desks, uh, Velvet? There ain't any desks in this room. Velvet Remedy swung around and saw the rows of chairs and the lectern. There was not a desk in sight. She sighed. Not the point. Maybe Celestia just didn't want them to be scared, I offered. I had to imagine that telling the children to lie, a lie that allowed them to believe there was something they could do, was kinder than leaving them to feel helpless. Or was my belief born of corrupt kindness? I grunted, hating Trixie. Red lights popped onto my EFS compass, several of them converging on the door next to Velvet Remedy. Velvet, I hissed, motioning her towards me before pointing warningly at the door. Calamity, now wearing his battle saddle, flew into position, covering at the door. I whispered up a prayer to the goddess Celestia that ended up becoming more of an apology for shooting her in the face. The door opened, and I felt myself go numb. It was a small, canterlot ghoulized unicorn child. Her school filly uniform melted into her flesh. There were several more behind her, all colts and fillies, locked in the endless routine of going to and from their exams, until they spotted us, in the air filled with a sound more horrifying than I could imagine. A wordless sound of unadulterated and monstrous aggression from a chorus of achingly childlike voices. No, 
Celeste, have mercy. I was frozen. My eyes locked onto the monster children. I... I couldn't do this. Calamity fired the twin bullets from his sniper's uh, from his battle saddle, tearing into the filly's head, blasting more of her brains into the remainder. A remember your shield poster. Turning to the rest of us, he yelled, "What are y'all waiting for?" I knew they weren't really children. I knew they were, at best, feral animals, and that they would kill us if I didn't return, fire, or run. But my body refused to do so. Calamity fired again. Next to me, the Overcaster anesthetic spell to a young colt, only to moan as the spell had no apparent effect. Even Steelhooves seemed to have faltered a moment. But now, I heard the ports of his missile launcher open. Whoosh! Boom! Two rockets fired at an un at an upward angle exploded against the ceiling, bringing large chunks of it raining down on the creature's children below, along with half a row of chairs from the classroom above us. I stumbled back as two colts and fillies were crushed under the collapsing ceiling. The little pony in my head, sickly wondering if that had killed them or just inconvenienced them enough that their lights went out on my EFS compass. Little Pip, Stu commanded, get us up there. Up there? I felt like I was thinking through sludge. Now, he bellowed, snapping me out of my stupor. Clement swooped past me, firing again as another canterlot zombie colt galloped through the open hole, door and leapt over the rubble towards us. The twin shot hit the monster child in the side, knocking him down to the chairs. I wrapped my levitation field around the rest of us and levitated us up to the ceiling and through it. Behind me, I heard the sinister warping sound that signaled one of the fallen cloud children was rising back up, filled with necromantic life. I poked my head out of the classroom, looking both ways down the corridor. I kept expecting the zombie children to appear, but there were no hostiles in sight on my EFS compass. I couldn't tell if they were still trying to get up to this level, or if they had ceased pursuit the moment they could no longer see or hear us, literally out of sight, out of mind. The hallway proved a new danger. The air was filled with a pink haze, which grew thicker towards a ventilation grate in the ceiling. I could just make out the large metal fan behind the grate, warped and fusing with the metal on the shaft itself. The den's patch didn't look particularly large, but it was slowly growing. Steel hooves, I instructed, closing the door. We need you to scout ahead, find the shortest path into another cloudless section of the building. The steel ranger nodded. I opened the door long enough for him to gallop through, then closed it again. Hey Pip, Clamity said, his voice almost a whisper. I'm pretty sure one of the first ministry buildings was the Ministry of Magic. I'm thinking we should pop in there and grab ourselves some proper magical energy weapons, just in case we have to deal with a bunch more cantalock ghouls. Here we go, I sighed, groaning inside and forcing myself not to face hoof. Well, Magical energy guns are a lot better against Canterlock ghouls than what we're packing. Stew was aside. Calamity reasoned altogether too reasonably. And we shouldn't just rely on him to bring down the house every time we face more of the monsters. For that matter, Valdemir chimed in, we really need to stop in the Ministry of Peace. It's right across the way, and we could definitely use the medical supplies. Especially if you end up fighting those alicorns. Oh, of course we do. I turned to both of them. Look, the more sightseeing we do, the longer and more dangerous this trip becomes. We're already taking longer than I would have wanted, just getting out of the first building. All the more reason to get the medical supplies, while we can. You know the Ministry of Peace will have supplies somewhere. I nodded. Somewhere. That's the problem. You're not talking about a brief stop, either of you. You're talking about exploring these buildings. But everybody nodded. I know that. I know it's dangerous, but I'm just worried... No, you just want to see Fluttershy's ministry. Valva took a step back, feigning a wounded heart. My expression was unmoving. Okay, fine. 
Yes, I do. But I am also worried. She insisted. About steel hooves. Steel hooves? Calamity echoed. Why would you be worried for him? The guy can survive anything. Up to, and including, the apocalypse. Velvet Remedy rolled her eyes. He's immortal, not indestructible. The armor might repair itself, but how do we know he's okay inside? The only thing that heals ghouls are radiation and healing potions. And that suit of his is designed to self-administer. Now, the last time he restocked his armor's medicine dispensary was Stable 29. And since then, he's been shot through in anti-tank rounds, fallen a few hundred feet, and gone through whatever he was through in Zebratown. Look, Velvet, if Steelers was in trouble, he'd tell us, Calamity said. Would he? Velvet questioned. I found myself caught, unable to decide which of my friend's flaws were at play here. Velvet Remedy's excessive worries, or Steelhoof's stubborn stoicism? As suspected, it was the other problem that Velvet had claimed Steelhoof's was being. I couldn't blame her for being concerned. The best case, she was a doctor who was being denied the ability to examine a patient. And the Wasteland wasn't in the habit of serving up to best cases very often. I was beginning to kick myself for having taken Steelhoof's durability for granted. Well, there was gummies, Calamity offered. But that was before he got shot, Clement reminded the Pegasus. Afterwards, you only came back long enough to pick us up. Damn. Clement rubbed his brow under his hat. I reckon you might be onto something there. Turning to me, he suggested, Lil Pip, maybe I'll ought to run a diagnostic on his armor, and see just what state our friend is in. For all we know, he might really be torn up under all that steel. I looked at the door, wishing Steel Hooves was back already. Okay, Ministry of Peace and Ministry of Magic, but only the fastest looks, and only until we find what we need. Targeted missions, no sightseeing. They both nodded. Then, Velvet Remedy added, I was actually really hoping to take a peek at the goddess's castle, too. I face hoofed. No. I gasped, collapsing against the storage room shelving, the impact sending several boxes of cleaner toppling down onto my head as I fought for breath. My heart struggled in my chest. Velvet Remedy slammed into the door and slammed it close behind her, the last one in. She crashed into steel hooves, bouncing between him and the workbench Calamity had curled up onto before falling to her knees. I can't believe you've done that to yourselves before, she gasped wretchedly. Velvet began passing around healing potions. I knew the police station was much worse, Calamity moaned, downing his potion. Why do you think I saw blowing up a boiler as a better alternative? Velvet Remedy groaned shakily. Forgiven. She floated her own potion to her lips and drank greedily. I drank the potion Velvet had passed to me and closed my eyes, waiting for the healing effects to begin to mend my cloud-ravaged body. Velvet passed a second round of potions, and I could see that the stop in the Ministry of Peace would truly be necessary after all. Weakly, I slid myself across the floor towards Steel Hooves. Lay down, soldier, I demanded, hurting too much to perform the social dance that friendship and civility required. Steel Hooves obeyed without question, accidentally knocking over a row of plungers with his armored tail. I pulled a tool from my barding and jacketed my, and jacked my pit bug into his armor, running a diagnostic. Steel Hooves' pleasure at this invasion of privacy was radiating off of him, but he didn't move or speak. The little pony in my head began to panic when my pit buck started flashing medical alerts across my EFS. I fought to keep my little pony calm as I worked to strip away the alarms that were probably false. My pit buck's medical assist spell was not calibrated towards ghouls, much less whatever physiology was normal for canterlot ghouls. I wish I had Velvet Remedy's understanding of medicine, although considering her reaction to ghouls, that might not be much help. The one thing I could say for sure was that Steel Hooves' armor was completely out of healing supplies, and apparently had been since parked way through Zebra Town. 
The stallion was keeping himself going on painkillers and combat drugs, most of which were also nearly depleted. What had he been planning to do when those run out? Hell, one of his legs was broken in multiple places. The arm was holding it together like a cast. Not okay, I told him sternly, feeling like I was wearing Velvet Remedy's horseshoes. He said nothing. If you're in trouble like this, you need to tell us. I'll be fine, he finally said, but I noticed he wouldn't look at me when he said it. The damn thing was, he probably would be so long as he didn't get himself killed permanently before he could resupply his armor. Between now and then, however, was a whole world of pain. The painkillers were hanging, handling a lot of it now, but not all of it, and they would soon be gone. This felt like self-punishment. Maybe for what happened at Buckland Bridge. Or maybe because of bad memories. Wounds and regrets that coming here and to Zebra Town had made fresh again. I could point out that when the painkiller stopped, the pain might hamper him, putting us all at risk. That was the sort of argument I knew he would listen to and accept, but it was also cold and selfish. Stulus was our friend, and he deserved better than that. I needed something to say that would show him we cared, and yet still would persuade him in his ears. I looked at Velvet Remedy for help, only to be reminded of our argument about the Fluttershy Orb. Velvet Remedy was escaping, Stilhoos was abusing himself. I looked at Calamity, I wondered if he was doing any better. Calamity seemed fine, but then, so had Steelhooves, until I took a deeper look. At least Zenith was okay, right? No. Zenith never really seemed okay. After what she had been through, I'd be surprised if there was an okay in her world that even vaguely resembled the one in our own. Her freakout at being bitten was still fresh in my mind. But at least she was getting better, I thought, rather than worse. Although, at the time we had left, Zenith had still not admitted to Zephyr that she was her mother. Was that just Zenith being a zebra? Or was that a warning sign? Something else I had missed. Steelus pushed himself back up, disconnecting his armor from my pet buck. I should go. Go where? Out he replied, to find the next room that had clear of the cloud. Velvet Remedy tossed over shield, the shimmering sheen of magic filling the hallways, just in time for the three baby dragons to slam into it. The little wingless creatures growled and clawed at the shield, their eyes glowing, their faces distorted in rage. Oh, aren't they cute? Velvet Remedy cooed. She got a resounding no from the rest of us. More trouble at our four, Calamity warned. I spun around. From the other end of the hall, several Canterlock Colts and fillies emerged from the stairwell. The lead filly had another cloud-ruined baby dragon on her back. I stared at the filly, my eyes drawn to... Little Pip, what are you staring at? In blank horror, I hissed. Look at her cutie mark. The school filly's tattered uniform gave a clear view of the blob of dark pink that emblazoned on the cloud child's flank. I reeled at the implications. The child had gotten her cutie mark after the mega spell, after she had died, that the cloud had transformed the poor little filly into an undying monster it was horrific enough, but somehow the idea that it had warped and corrupted her to the point that the pink cloud had stolen from her what, she sh what should have made her special, and replaced that with itself, it was somehow so much crueler, so much more abhorrent. The child horror lowered her head, her horn glowing a violent pink. Thick wisps of pink clouds snaked out of the air around her glowing horn, swirling as it filled the corridor. The filly was actually conjuring pink cloud, the baby dragon jumped from her back and began charging at us, his little claws tearing at the hallway carpeting. The twin shot from Calamity's battle saddle echoed through the hallway. The baby dragon's body ragdolled against the wall. A moment later, the tendrils of pink began to reach us. 
Immediately my head swam. My headaches spiking. I backpedaled, trying to get away, only to hit Velvet Remedy's shield. The three baby dragons behind us gave little roars of anticipation and violent desire. What, Clemity coughed, is with the rest of you? The Pegasus dropped to the ground, unable to keep flying as the pink cloud began to eat as it insides. He fired blindly into the pink. They're not really children. I could hear the cloud children galloping down the hallway towards us. All I could see was pink and black, the edges of my vision going dark. My EFS compass was showing nothing but a mass of blurry red. Every breath seemed to shrivel my lungs, making me fight harder to get half the air that I could before. Velvet Remedy collapsed beside me, her shield going down. One of the baby monsters leapt at me, claws scratching at my barding and digging wet scratches in my flesh, its teeth sinking into my mane, trying to tear the back of my neck. Steelers opened fire in the hallway, and I curled up as I was pelted with concussive waves and shrapnel from the close quarters explosions. The blast left my ears ringing, my sense of direction and balance shot to hell. But they also thinned the cloud. My gut was twisting, my insides felt like they had began to rot, but my headache cleared just enough that I could focus. I floated out a little Macintosh, aiming at the small little monster gnawing on my back, and fired. I felt the creature from my back drop. The poor thing, which should have been allowed to grow up, to be a dragon. Velvet Remedy curled up into a ball, crying. The two other baby dragons were trying to eat her. Her body was a tapestry of shallow, bleeding scratches. I fired twice more, giving them off of her, and I stumbled to my hooves. Somehow, dreadfully, it was easier for me to shoot these creatures than the monsters who took the form of children. I thought the fact that they had never grown old enough to talk or think like people made it okay for me to treat them as rabid animals. My eyes forward sparkle was flashing medical warnings. Even thinned, the pink mist was killing me. I needed to get out before my internal organs started shutting down. Wrapping velvet in my magic, I galloped as fast as my legs and lungs would take me. A staggering trot, trying to get out of the pink. Behind me, Clemity fired once more, then pivoted and followed, stumbling as he attempted to run. The air filled with that nauseum, grating sound as the eyes of the baby dragon Calamity had shot began to glow and it began to growl. Get to the top, our Applejack's ranger called back to us. I'll hold them here. None shall pass. We're down to the last of our healing potions, Velvet Remedy warned softly, tears in her eyes. I groaned as I drank the potion she floated over me. We hadn't gotten to Ministry Walk yet, and I still hadn't had the chance to restock Steelhoof's armor. I watched as the slashes of red that covered Velvet closed gently, mending themselves before my eyes, leaving her looking unmarred, yet still covered with her own blood. The mare swayed despondently, then curled up next to Calamity on the large bed in the center of the room. The large circular room had no windows. Both the fireplace and the chute provided means for the pink cloud to enter the room. Fortunately, the magic ventilation spell had prevented the cloud from pooling here, leaving the air only the lightest shades of pink. Survivable level of pinks, so long as none of us fell asleep here. The administrator's room had been a lovely once, a solemn room of violets and blues, with a mural of clouds drifting over the walls, and a delicate orateness to every feature and piece of furniture. Ghosts of that beauty remained on the greasy rot of the carpet, bed, and tapestries. A golden scroll-shaped stand leaned next to one of the walls that crumbled bookshelves and filled with decayed books and the residue of dissolved scrolls. Next to the center bed was another golden stand, this one holding a terminal. Its screen glowed softly. The door into this room 
had been one of the hardest locks I had ever encountered. I expected no less from the terminal. It just isn't right, Velvet Remedy choked, leaning against Calamity. All those children, those little baby dragons. Calamity wrapped her wing around her as she began to sob again. They didn't deserve this. It... It's so unfair. It was worse than unfair. It was evil. I felt a bubbling rage simmer in my beating heart. But there was no point to be angry at. I couldn't be mad at the victims. And the zebras, and possibly ponies, who created and deployed the mega spell, were long dead. No. I was furious at the pink cloud itself. How dare it! I began to hack, trying to focus, not wanting to take out my frustrations on the terminal, lest I make a mistake and get locked out. Little Pip, Velvet said softly, if... if the mega spell is still working here, still pouring out its poison, her eyes closed, her voice trembling, finding determined steel. We need to stop it. I nodded. The password was apologies. The Apple Orb My host was checking his watch. The little hoof pointed to seven, and the big one just a few minutes past the hour. It was either late morning, or less than an hour from midnight. I had no way of knowing. The hallway was a cold, gray metal, with no windows, yet it felt like night. A soft chime came from, uh, drew my host's attention. He turned as elevator doors opened, and party music played over the speaker in the room. The elevators seemed empty. My host stepped away, watching cautiously. The elevator doors closed, cutting off the sound of music. I could barely hear the soft hum as the elevator began to descend. My host looked to his left. Empty hallway. No doors, ending with the heavy steel door of a vault. He looked to his right. A magical field of blue light shimmered in front of an iron gate. The room beyond was filled with humming mainframes. I apologize for running late, an exotic voice said, from the nevertheless sounding slightly muffled. First, the head of the zebra appeared as she pulled her hood back. Then, the rest of her. I did not mean to make you wait. I felt my host press his lips together. That's alright, Skora. But, you'll have to hurry. Security will cycle in any minute now. When it does, we've arranged for the shield to drop, but only drop for four minutes. You'll have to get in, get the data, and get out. I saw my head turn away as I fished a key out of the pocket of my security uniform. This will get you through the gate. You know which system you're looking for, right? Zakora nodded. A sad look formed on her face. I ask if this is worth the cost. The lives of ponies will be lost. I felt a frown edge across my host's muzzle. We will be willing to make sacrifices if we are going to end this war. Your success here will get you the Caesar's trust and will allow you to get close to him. My host stepped back. But if it helps, I'm sure they will arrange for the weapons factories in those schematics to have minimal staff when the zebras hit them. My host's frown turned with a grimace. Unfortunately, we've had a small complication. Zakora raised an eyebrow. They've installed some sort of new gemstone detector, something from the Ministry of Image, all over the place. It is designed to detect zebra talismans like your cloak, and is not part of the normal security system so we can't just shut it down without raising alarms. You'll have to remove your cloak before going in. I will not need it once in there, so I will leave it in your care. Zakora slipped out of her cloak, now wearing only a satchel. She looked strangely naked without the jewelry I had seen her wearing before. The shield of blue energy suddenly went down. My host sucked in a breath. Quickly, strike me down. Hard! Zakora spun and bucked at my host. One hoof caught him squarely in the chest, cracking at least one rib. The other sank hard into the soft flesh of his neck. Zakora's eyes widened as I collapsed, choking, fighting for air. 
She had clearly not intended to land a possibly fatal blow. My host waved her on, coughing, and fighting to remain conscious. As the court up galloped down the hall, I heard her unlock the gate and pull it open. My vision was blurred. I sat there, fighting harder and harder, trying to breathe, air struggling to get through my throat and into my chest. I heard a chime behind me. The door opened, and an apple green stallion in a tuxedo barding stepped out, looking around. Apple snack. The moment he saw me, his eyes widened, then narrowed, taking in the discarded zebra cloak nearby. Damn it! I knew something was wrong! He looked up, observing the open gate and the disabled magical shield. Hold on, Buck. I'll get... Applejack froze, his voice silencing abruptly as Akora rounded the mainframes, heading back. You! Applesnack snapped, stepped into battle stance as Akora stepped short. You! Applesnack called out, fury in his voice. Applesnack? As Akora said, failing to rhyme, her eyes growing wider. She trusted you. She let you into our house, and you betrayed her. Applesnack was striding slowly forward. I opened my heart to you, because she believed me too, and she wanted me to. I even began to trust you. To like you. A zebra. How could I have been so stupid? App. Apple. My host wheezed, holding up a hoof. Don't. But there was almost no sound in my voice. I, we, struggled to get up, but our hooves wouldn't work. I realized that we really were dying. She thought you were a friend. You broke her heart. Applesnack was roaring. I suddenly knew. This was what was hurting him. I remembered Steelhoof's denial when I told him the truth about Zakora, and the painful resignation that seemed to follow. I would prefer she had killed those monsters with cold-blooded calculation, Steelhoof had told Calamity, regarding my rampage in Arbru. It wasn't the killing he thought was bad. It was the blind rage. And now you've come back, tonight of all nights, to hurt her again. Zakora crouched down submissively. You have caught me. I do not fight, she intoned. I am your prisoner tonight. Applesack snapped, shaking, then screamed, bellowing. No, Zakora, that is not... How you say died resisting arrest no oh steel hooves don't do this he charged turning and bucking at Zakora. she didn't try to dodge at least not the first time she did the second and the fourth and third i missed that one my host flailed as darkness began to seep into the edges of his vision the fight for breath was getting harder and he was losing. My whole body felt weak and distant. I didn't feel a hum the elevator at all, but we heard the chime. As the door slid open, an odd, familiar song flowed out of the hallway. How can I shield you from the horror and the lies, when all that once held meaning is shattered, ruined, and bleeding, and the whispers in the darkness tell me we won't survive? It was the song that had played in Steelhoof's shack, the morning I first met him, the song he became strangely lost to. My host struggled to get up again, trying to make any part of his body work now. We weren't getting any air anymore. Down the hall, I saw Zakora strike out, trying to defend herself. Applesnack ducked under the kick and brought up one of his own, striking her underneath and sending her body flying against the wall. Zakora hit the wall with a meaty smack leaving a splash of blood as she fell. From within the elevator came a horribly familiar voice. Nothing, Scrooge. Shrews. I know the boy's planning on proposing tonight, but if we're missing our song because Sergeant Steelhoofs has become Sergeant Coldhooves... Oh no. Oh no 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 no! Don't come out here, Applejack. Don't see this. It will hurt you if you see this. We've been trying to repair our relationship, Steelhoofs had told me. Ever since the night, she had seen me in the darkness. Seen the darkness in me. Not learned about. Seen. 
Applejack, wearing a little black dress that was clearly a rig rarity original, stepped out of the elevator. And she looked to her right, seeing an empty hall ending in a vault door. She looked left. Her eyes widened, pupils dilating to pinpoints as she saw Applesnack, bloodied, his torso heaving with each breath, standing over the very bloody corpse of Zakora.